Hey everyone, today I have a quick little video for you where I just wanna share five common myths when it comes to teaching phonics. With a new school year right around the corner, I thought it would be a good time to go over these myths and talk about why they actually are myths and what we can do to kind of dispel those rumors, those inconsistencies that are out there when we are thinking about teaching phonics. If you're ready to hear what these myths are, give this video a like, subscribe to my channel, and let's get started. number one is that phonics instruction is boring. Now this is a common misconception and it's actually a big reason why the reading workshop model took off in the way it did. When we think about the way phonics instruction was taught a long time ago, many people imagine, you know, students sitting at desks, the teacher is up at the board saying ah, and the kids say ah, b, b, so on and so forth, right? They're like decoding words. It seems like a kind of uh, robotic type of instruction. And then when we think of the reading workshop model, what was so enticing to many administrators and teachers alike was that you'd walk into the classroom and it appeared that, you know, everyone was off in their own special land of reading and they all had their book bins open and everyone was into their book and enjoying reading. And in fact, I've shared this story before, but that's what I loved so much about the reading workshop model when I was first introduced to it. When I was teaching in Las Vegas, I had walked into one of the second grade classrooms during my prep time, because I had to ask her a question and her kids were literally all spread out around the classroom. They were all enjoying a book that was like soft and music play, playing in the background. And I literally was like, what is this sorcery? This is amazing. The management of it looked great. It looked like all the kids were super engaged in their books and they may have been, I don't wanna take that away at all. But the point here is that there's kind of these two different theories and like, oh, look at this one promotes a love of reading. And this one is just like boring instruction that mostly the teacher's talking. I would also love to know from you if you had a similar experience, let me know down in the comments. But what I want to dispel about this myth is that our phonics instruction does not need to be boring. First and foremost, while you have that teacher up front giving that explicit phonics instruction, we know is effective. So we do need some of that with our students. But then we also know that there are so many different ways we can make it more enticing, more engaging, and more fun for our students. The first that comes to mind is of course multi-sensory learning. Not only is it engaging, but it's also highly effective for teaching students how to read. And we can incorporate different multi-sensory activities in almost every area of our phonics instruction. All you need to do is look on the internet to find tons of quick multi-sensory activities that you can do to teach phonics. We know right off the top of our head that during phonemic awareness instruction, we can use little counters, we can use cubes, we can use those poppets. I have a whole video right here where I share 10 different multi-sensory activities, five for literacy and five for math, that are easy, engaging, and effective. When we're teaching our students letter formation, we can get out some sand, some sandpaper. We can have our students put our hands in the air and do sky writing. All of these things are actually really engaging to our students and they're not just sitting there listening to the teacher talk. They are actively engaged and that's important. After that whole group and small group learning, we can also make our activities enticing and engaging as well, so they're not so boring. We have hands-on literacy centers. I have a bunch of task cards. Here are some beginning sound puzzles where students have to actually match things together. We have phonics games that students can play with a partner where they are practicing all sorts of skills and having a whole lot of fun. I have spent years creating tons of fun and engaging games for our students, so the last thing I would wanna think is that our phonics instruction is boring. Phonics myth number two is that only some of our students need explicit phonics instruction. Now it has been shown that about 40% of our students will learn to read using varied practices and 5% of that 40 seem to learn how to read effortlessly, right? Um, and there's many different things that go into that, but only about 5% of students seem to present that way. And then another 35% of students seem to be able to learn how to read using tons of different practices. Maybe reading workshop worked for them, all sorts of different things and maybe it didn't include that you know systematic scope and sequence of phonics instruction. So while that might be true for that 40% of students, first of all that still means 60% of our students require effective systematic phonics instruction in order to learn how to read. And while that other 40% is still learning how to read, they're picking it up using different strategies that they're creating, some memorization strategies, some whole word strategies, they still greatly benefit 
from explicit phonics instruction. Now in K through two, it's really easy to identify those students that are just, you know, doing really well with their phonics instruction. Uh, they're decoding words easily. It seems like they are a great reader and they very well may be. But that also has to do in part with the words we tend to use when we're teaching. We are often teaching our students how to read using one syllable words as we introduce new phonics skills and making them relatively easy to decode, meaning the words are pretty regular. But where the wheels start to fall off is usually in those later grades where students are coming into contact with plenty of books of words they've never seen before. Many of them are multisyllabic and they don't have that phonics instruction, those phonics tools to be able to break up the word and decode it. They also may have not been taught morphology yet, so they aren't able to identify those parts of the words and try to make meaning from it. So while it might be really easy to identify that 40% of students in your class that seem to really get it, and you may want to focus all your efforts on the other 60%, please be a little bit wary of that. Still make sure that all of your students are receiving that explicit phonics instruction, and there's also three things I want you to keep in mind. When you're introducing new phonics skills to your students, make sure you are introducing multisyllabic words and not only one-syllable words. Throw a few in there, and especially in small groups, when that group comes back to you, make sure you are giving them plenty of opportunities to decode longer words. Secondly, if you're doing that, you wanna make sure you teach some syllabication rules so your students understand how to break up those syllables. If you need to know more about how to teach that, I have these two videos right here. These are my syllable videos where I break down each syllable type and how to teach it. And also make sure you're giving your students plenty of opportunities with nonsense words. Again, in K through two, many of the words they will see are ones they may have heard of before, they may have seen in plenty of their texts, but as they get older, they are going to run into many nonsense words until they figure out what they mean. Phonics myth number three is that you must follow your scope and sequence. Now you might be thinking, wait, Susan, I definitely should follow a scope and sequence. Following a systematic scope and sequence is extremely important when teaching phonics instruction, and that is correct. But where the tricky part lies is that you don't want to blindly follow your scope and sequence. Any scope and sequence, whether it's a phonics scope and sequence, whether it's a writing scope and sequence, whether it is a phonemic awareness scope and sequence, they are teacher tools meant to guide you and your students in their instruction. And so an effective scope and sequence is going to start with more simple skills that slowly build to more difficult ones. And that is a great place to start. But you as the teacher are the most important tool. Your knowledge is much more important than the scope and sequence. So what that means is when you get your new class of students, if you recognize that you know 80% of your students already know how to decode CVC words or wherever you're at in this scope and sequence where you're supposed to start the year, that means that maybe you move through that a little bit faster. If it says you're on that for three weeks and after the first week you're like, okay, my students are ready for more, give them more. Follow that scope and sequence, but move it up a little quicker. Also, the same goes with the opposite. If you're like, hey, I only had three weeks to teach CVC words, but wait a second, half my class still cannot do this. We had to focus way more time on letter names and sounds slow it down. It is your job to kind of recognize both your whole group students' needs as well as individual students' needs to make sure that you're meeting them where they're at. Now, if you don't have a scope and sequence that you need as a guide, I have a free phonics scope and sequence as well as one for phonemic awareness that I will link down in the description for you to grab. But again, just remember that it's not, it's not the end all be all. Like you need to be able to look at them, you need to be able to guide your students based on where they're at on that scope and sequence. I hope that makes sense. Phonics myth number four is that your decodable texts need to be 100% decodable. Now, I don't really know where this myth came to be and the percentage of, you know, how decodable a text needs to be is like widely varied and argued amongst experts. And some people in the field that I highly respect do create 100% decodable texts and that's fine. But I do think it's important to note that there is no research that says a decodable text needs to be 100% decodable. Now I talk a lot about decodable text in this video right here that I just uploaded only a few months ago. So I'm going to link this down in the description below, but I think it's really important to recognize that our students do need plenty of opportunities to read authentic texts and we can make authentic decodable texts. 
This book right here by Wiley Blevins is one I highly recommend. I'll also link this down below. It is very easy to read, like many of his texts are, and he gives all sorts of examples of what good and not so good decodable text might look like. So what happens is sometimes when we are using 100% decodable text, which again, if you're talking about a decodable text, one decodable text is not decodable to another student because it's all based on your scope and sequence that you're teaching, as well as what words and phonic skills and patterns that student already knows. So just getting that out of the way. But what can happen is if we are so stuck to this percentage of especially something as high as 100%, the authenticity of the text, the the sensicalness of the text, I don't think that's a word, but sometimes we can make nonsensical texts by trying to make sure that they all have, you know, short O in them. And then what happens is the quality of the text is going to go down and students aren't even understanding what they're reading. Oftentimes authors of these decodable texts will use words that are just not used often at all and also take away from the meaning of the story just to fall in line with a decodability factor. So I think going forward in your phonics instruction this year, as you're looking at your decodable texts, make sure they align with your scope and sequence, but also make sure they're high quality. Make sure that they make sense. If there are some words you have to pre-teach for students to understand the book, that's fine. Now again, you wanna think about a percentage. I like to stick around 80%, some experts say 70%, some say 85%, there is no right number. My personal preference is around 80. So as long as my students are able to decode 80% of that text, I can pre-teach them the other words. Some of those other words might be irregular heart words that we are already learning. And that way the story can actually make sense for students. They can decode it and comprehend it. Because remember, comprehension is always our end goal. So just something to think about as the year goes on. And last but not least, phonics myth number five is that our students will naturally develop fluency. When we're talking about fluency, we know that accurate decoding is the first step. We need our students to be able to accurately decode words in order to become fluent in what they're reading. Otherwise they can't read anything that's on the page. So rightfully so, there's going to be a heavy emphasis on teaching your students those phonic skills so they are able to decode those words quickly and accurately. But then sometimes the information is then misrepresented and it's thought that, oh, if we just teach students how to decode these words, they will naturally become more fluent readers since they're able to decode them. And that is not always the case. I recently did this video right here from phonics to fluency, where I go over some great strategies where we can take our students from that simple decoding to then becoming fluent readers. I'll definitely link that video down below if you want to learn a little more about that. But some of the strategies we can do is scaffold our fluency instruction. So yes, we wanna start at the word level. Actually, we even wanna start higher than that at the sound level, where we want our students to be able to see the letter F and say F, see the letter G, G, and also know that it makes J after we've taught that. Then we want to move to that word level. Can students decode the sounds they already know in a word in isolation? Can they do it quickly? Can they do it accurately? Then I like to move to phrases before jumping to sentences. We wanna do quick phrases and then to sentences, then into longer paragraphs. One of my favorite tools for scaffolding in this way are blending lines. Here's an example of what it looks like. But you can see we start with that phonics skill in isolation. And actually these ones are made based on Wiley Blevins advice. And we switch out the initial sound in that first line and then we switch out the final sound before switching out the medial sound but then we work on those phonic skills in phrases as well as in sentences and it really gives students tons of opportunities to practice decoding those skills in various different ways there are also plenty of other effective fluency practices like choral reading echo reading and partner reading that i also talk about in that video that are going to be great for getting your students from phonics to fluency so there you have five common myths when it comes to teaching phonics. Like I said, I thought this video would be a good one to do a few weeks before the school year starts, just to get your mind thinking about phonics instruction next year and how you might teach it. Just to recap one last time, those five myths are that phonics instruction is boring, that only some students need explicit phonics instruction, that you must follow your scope and sequence, that texts have to be 100% decodable, and that students will naturally develop fluency. I know personally that I definitely believed a couple of those in the past. If you also had any misconceptions or believed any of those myths, let me know down in the comments. No shame here, we are all just learning. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up so I know. Make sure you are subscribed to my channel and click that bell. That way you're notified of every new video. See you in the next one, bye.